प्रश्न माइक हर गया सर right uh, yeah, i think last week uh, we were talking about research and uh, marketing information systems so uh, we discussed about uh, uh, what is marketing information system the system uh, how it works and uh, gathering data advantages of research and then we came to defining the problem and research objectives and developing the research plan for collecting information and then we were talking about primary data and secondary data and we discussed what are the advantages and disadvantages and uh, the issues in gathering uh, secondary data uh, and then also uh, then we came up to the level of planning a primary data collection method right so under that we talked about uh, the the steps that we have to follow in gathering such information right so uh, now what we have to discuss today is from here the research approach contact method sampling plan and research instruments so uh, let's look at first the the research approach now in research approach we have uh, basically three approaches that we can talk about first one is about observational research now when it comes to observational research uh, that is all about how you observe something and gather data right uh, have you observed something and gather data now when you observe uh, your your workflows and what is happening in the bank or basically your branch counters your branch you can sometimes uh, gather lot of information about customer sentiments Quality levels or the satisfaction levels, so on and so forth, and also you can also uh, gather information related to your processes, whether those are really customer centric or whether those processes are actually rejected by the customer. Now you don't have to give them a question here for that, but by observing how they behave in the uh, branch, you might be able to get those information. so similarly this observational research is always towards gathering data uh, and understanding the behavior pattern sentiments uh, feedback of customers by observing now uh, I, i i recall a very interesting uh, story about uh, observational research so that you will understand a lot uh, the value of it there was this uh, company uh, which is selling mattresses and this is actually a, uh, a real research finding so when they were selling mattresses uh, they wanted to know what people really 
value in buying a mattress and when they are preparing their next mattress what kind of things that they should do and what customer really uh, want out of them so in order to do that while they were having the survey research they also did a observational research where they fixed some cameras uh, to their outlet and they were watching how people were behaving when they come to buy the mattress right now when they were looking at the whole thing they found a very uh, very common behavior among uh, the customers that is uh, when the customers come the the when when the when the man and the woman come the man actually looks at whether uh, it is bumpy and the texture and how uh, whether it is comfortable all kind of things but out of all uh, the woman most of the time and sometimes the man uh, they actually uh, do something like this. they they lift the mattress and they keep the mattress again they just lift the mattress uh, and and after lifting the mattress they just keep it and that that they show among people at a higher frequency so now they were wondering why people are doing this because they are not actually checking the comfort by lifting the mattress so they were thinking what it is right okay fine before i before i go and tell you what they have exactly discovered after having a chat with the customers uh, can i get from you do you have any idea as to why the customer is doing like that what do you think let me ask from dilshan dilshan you have any idea why uh, they were lifting the mattress and keeping it again uh so maybe to see whether it was easily portable like uh, whether you can move it from like if you are shifting from one house to the another uh all right if like you are like cleaning and all whether it's easy to lift the mattress <laughs> that's right that's right and why do you think most of the women were doing it yeah because of the cleaning thing i think uh, it's easy to clean if it's like if it's easily liftable i think it's easy to clean like under the yeah, bed yeah, spot on. yeah spot on right <laughs> so in fact they they started asking uh, why they were doing it from and and they they gave the same answer most of the women said because when the when the man goes out to work uh, then the husband goes out to work uh, generally the women get involved with cleaning so when they are cleaning they, they the mattress should be portable for them to move it here and there and sometimes to take it and put on sun uh, on, on sunlight uh, and that is a important factor for them because if it is too heavy they can't clean actually i'm also facing it by after taking a spring mattress it is it is really difficult for me to even for me to move it because it's that heavy right so uh actually I, i don't advise anyone to take that spring mattress <laughs> although it is comfortable you can't really clean it so what they really found is this so they they found the, there is a need in the consumer to have a light weighted mattress right so that is not something that comes to our mind straight unless we would have gone through that research right so that is one of one of the uh, things that uh, uh, that uh, that was a real life example uh, where they found out of observational research uh, what what they should be doing and how they should uh, go for their next mattress so similarly uh, uh, there are other observational research done sometimes to look at the uh, traffic patterns right now you may have seen certain people on road counting vehicles right uh, so uh, now if you really look at how in taking decisions for example if you want to if there is a traffic congestion and you want to make a particular road one way to avoid that if you make the road one way throughout the day then throughout the day nobody will be able to use that road right and on only one way traffic will be allowed but maybe it is a road patronized by so many people so instead of doing that when you do the research you might find in the morning there is a traffic flow towards colombo right and in the evening there is a huge traffic flow from colombo and in between when you avoid the office hours in between there is no rush the road is really clear right so if that is the case 
then there is no point you making it one way for the whole day rather you can make it one way in the morning allowing traffic to flow from uh, uh, towards colombo and in the evening uh, clear the, uh, basically make the one way from the other side where you will uh, allow the traffic to go from colombo uh, to towards the uh, from colombo right so there are roads which are being done like that so if you go in the morning they say from morning uh, seven o'clock to nine o'clock uh, maybe the, the, the one way so you on, on one side of the road you get that sign on the other end of the road you get the sign from uh, three o'clock to six o'clock seven o'clock one way right so that 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 decision is not taken by just uh, dreaming about it but by having some people who do, who do a research and find out what is the traffic flow and what are the peak hours what are the non peak hours right so this is how you do the observational research so you basically you can use several uh, technical uh, uh, machines and uh, mechanisms such as the cctv and also the traditional mechanism where you employ a person to uh, stay with a questionnaire or with a with a uh, with a list of uh, uh, things that they have to observe and we are they tick by observing what is happening right so in the day by taking those data you can come up to data back decisions which are more effective right so that is what so if you really apply it to your branch level uh, or to the bank uh, let's take a branch uh, being uh, being the most popular section in the in a branch now in a, in a branch uh, this is a superb uh, superb tool superb method where you can observe the behavior patterns as to what a customer do when when the person enters right and then what is the uh, satisfaction level right and uh, uh, what is the customer service and and the reaction to the service that they give when they talk with different people right so all those things you can observe so as a manager sometimes by looking at the cctv you may be able to get a very good idea as to what changes you should do to the physical arrangement to the layup uh, and also sometimes about uh, the Uh, certain uh, certain service levels of some people because if you see a person I mean, you might not hear the voice but if you see someone oh if you see from the cctv that the person serving the customer is not really smiling and having a stressful uh, mind so that is a that is a sign for you to address right so uh, basically this is another very good approach where you can uh, gather data and information uh, on behavior patterns and uh, certain uh, certain uh, decisions can be taken based on that so that is first approach the second approach is experimental research now you do experiments in labs right so you do experiments in labs and that is uh, when it comes to the scientific sci scientists and uh, the uh, science then you can talk about experiments that do that you do in labs where you uh, use rabbits uh, the uh, mouse and all kind of things monkeys and all right so those are experiments so there are very famous experiments uh, that has been done uh, uh, to find out how uh, the behave how the people will behave and also so many other scientific theories have been developed as a uh, with experimental research but if you really look at uh, the marketing side of it in the marketing side what we are really looking at is about uh, how we uh, how we uh, change certain variables and what is the behavior uh, as a result of the change as a result of the change right so that is something that we try to observe in marketing for example uh, you might uh, reduce the size of the product and you might see whether the customers are happy or not right yeah. So instead of reducing the price, you might reduce the size of the product and you might see whether the customers are happy or not. So if you get complaints saying that this portion is not enough, 
then you might increase it, right? Otherwise, you will keep it as it is. So that is one. So actually, you varied the portion and you started looking at uh, the behavior of the customer. So you changed one variable and you were looking at the other variable. So likewise, uh, you can check what is the uh, reaction from one variable to uh, by changing one variable to the other. For example, if you really look at things like price sensitivity, so you can increase the price and see the reaction of the customers. And when the price increase, the, if the, if the sales are going down at a higher rate, then you might decide, okay, it's not going to work because this is very price sensitive. So the moment I increase the price, I'm going to get a big hit because the demand is going down at a higher level. So that you will basically decide to reduce the price again. But if you increase the price, the variable price, and nothing happens to the demand, right? So one variable is price and the other variable is demand. And when you increase the price, nothing happens to the uh, demand. So that means this product is very low elastic, right? It's not uh, high, uh, the price elastic, elasticity of the product is low. So then if you increase the price, there will be no, no big impact on uh, quantity of sales, right? So if that is the case, then you can increase the price and uh, uh, take the, the, basically enjoy a higher profit from the sales. So likewise, experimental research is where you change one variable and see what are the other, what are the reactions of other variables, right? So then when it comes to variables, there are independent variables and dependent variables. Now, independent variable is a variable that has no impact, but dependent variable is a, a variable where when you change the independent variable, the dependent variable will change. For example, price, you can say it's independent variable. Sales, you can say is a dependent variable. So why we say that? Because when the price goes up, and price goes down, sales will move up and down. So sales is dependent on price. So price becomes independent variable, sales become a dependent variable. Right? So likewise, for uh, you can change these variables and do experiments in order to find out how the customers will behave towards those changes and also whether uh, you can uh, carry on certain developments to the product, quality improvements, uh, things like that, right? So that is experimental research. Then you have survey research. Now survey research is the most important type of research which you do to gather information using questionnaires, right? Now, survey research is where you go to the field, right? Now, what happens here is that you go to the field and you talk to people or you basically connect with people and you find out information, right? So there are, uh, there are different methods to do that. The most common method that you see in the survey research is uh, questionnaires, right? So you uh, distribute questionnaires and you get answers for those questionnaires and based on the answers you do your analysis and then you will find out uh, uh, the answers for your research problem right so that is that is the, that is a, a very common method that you find when doing research how you get information right uh, the second method can be personal interviews right so now this is where you don't have a you don't distribute a questionnaire, but you may be having a script where you have the most important information. And what you do is you basically uh, ask questions and try to find out more information or in-depth no, in uh, information knowledge about a particular issue, right? Now, there are certain issues where you cannot use questionnaires and find out, right? For example, emotions towards uh, your brand uh, or basically the experience of a customer, right? Now, for example, you might say, uh, you, might, you might ask the question, are you happy 
about our service? Then the answer is very simple, yes or no, right? Why, why you are happy is not a question that you can answer by ticking or ticking a box or saying yes or no. So it is a very descriptive thing. And even if you ask him to write, he might not write a lot. But then if you in, in, uh, engage with a discussion, then he will come out of his in-depth uh, uh, the, the, the feelings and as well as the emotions and as well as his real, uh, uh, real reaction towards uh, the service he has received. Right? So, so for some research, uh, the questionnaire will not work. So for those research, you need to have uh, discussions. For example, employee satisfaction, right? So sometimes when you give questionnaires, they may not give you the right answers. They will just give you uh, answers uh, uh, which may not reflect their true feelings. So sometimes if you go to in-depth interviews, they will come up with different things. There are some sensitive cases like uh, harassment, right? So now when it comes to a, a, a question, whether the, whether the fair treatment is given to the employees, you can't get it from a, uh, from a questionnaire. You have to go for an in-depth interview. And then when, when you want to know about the, uh, about the suggestions from customers as to how you should improve, now those are questions where you need to have interviews. Right? So when it comes to survey research, you have two key methods. Uh, one is administrating questionnaires that is by distributing questionnaires, you gather information. The second is that you uh, conduct interviews and try to get information by having a uh, discussion with the participants, right? So these are the three very common uh, things that you get when it comes to the research approach, right? Okay, let's go to the next one, uh, right? The second one, the, so the first one, research approach. The second one is, now once you select the research approach, how are you going to connect with people or uh, how are you going to connect with respondents to gather information? Now, for that, you have different contact methods, different contact methods. There are some traditional ones such as the mail questionnaires. And so what you do here is that you basically do a questionnaire, you may do a cover up letter and then you post it. Now this is the old traditional method where some people still follow, right? But actually today, today, if you really look at it, it's a very costly affair. It's a very, very costly affair and it's a very time consuming, uh, right? Uh, energy consuming affair, which is not actually very productive because even if you mail uh, a questionnaire, chances are very rare that the customers will respond you back. So this, uh, this is actually not a good method to follow now, right? Uh, because it, we, uh, now even, even you get a return envelope, stamped envelope, you may not actually respond because uh, now we, uh, posting a letter is a quite a challenge, right? And it's very costly. So uh, although it is there, I mean, it, it is very rarely used now. Uh, but after mail questionnaires, the next one that, that came is the email questionnaires. So here what you do is, you basically, instead of posting, you, you develop the questionnaire and you send it via email. So now again, that uh, although that is better than mail, uh, the traditional mails, postal system, Again, the people will find it a little difficult because if you send it via PDF, they have to print it, fill it, scan it again and send it to you. Or else you have to send an editable PDF where they have to fill it and uh, post it to you back again, right? Uh, again, uh, although it is better than the mail, uh, there is a better option than it, that is the online questionnaire. So there are online platforms where you can develop your questionnaire and send a link and once you send a link the people who are filling it can fill it and then the online platform has uh, the capability to gather those information and then actually cluster it also for example it might tell you okay this number of people said yes 
this number of people said no for this particular question. So they do the they do the uh, uh, the reporting part also, right? So they 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 uh, they report the data and uh, they cluster it and they give it to you uh, a product where you can straight away do the analysis. So today this research uh, the, the questionnaire can be administered through online platforms, uh, which is very user friendly and where you can get the customers to fill it very quickly by logging into the link and then it will also give you uh, 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 data which has been arranged properly rather than you trying to put it into manual excel sheets and uh, waste your time right so therefore uh, today from from traditional postal mail uh, the the questionnaires have shifted to online questionnaire platforms right H however one of the drawbacks here, whether it is postal, whether it is email, or whether it is uh, uh, online, is that you do not know who is filling the questionnaire. Right? Now, for example, I will send a questionnaire to Chaminda. Right? So I will send a link to Chaminda. Chaminda may be very busy. So Chaminda might tell his son or his assistant uh, I'm very busy, but uh, now th th this questionnaire link has come. I have to fill it also, otherwise, he will feel bad about me. So, you fill it and send it, right? Now, you don't know who fills it. Sometimes you might want to know about the, uh, the sentiments or the response from a CEO, but when you send the link to the CEO, secretary may be responding to you. So, actually, you're not getting the views of the CEO, but you are getting the views of the secretary or the personal assistant because CEO is so busy, he's not feeling it. Right? So likewise, the most uh, the most uh, disadvantage in this is that, uh, that you don't know who filled it, that right? you don't know who filled it unless the person who has filled it has taken that responsibility to fill it in a responsible manner by him or herself. The second problem is that it's very passive. So the moment you send it to a person, there will be little little motivation for him to fill it, right? So because uh, uh, you are not there in front of him, right? There is, there is no personal contact. There is no human contact. So he will not feel obliged. He will not feel obliged, right? For example, if I come to you, sit with you and ask you questions, you will answer, right? Because you are obliged to answer because I am in front of you. Otherwise, you will feel bad, right? But if I send you a question here, you are not that motivated to re read it because you are not feeling obliged because there is no one in front of you, right? So therefore, there is a higher chance that any of these forms, email or postal or online link, will fail uh, and, and the customer will not respond, right? So these are the challenges. To overcome these challenges, marketers have certain uh, kickers or basically motivators such as if you fill the questionnaire uh, you will be given a reward for about 10% uh, discount or as they might tell you okay if you fill the questionnaire uh, we will give you a gift or they might tell you the first 100 respondents will get a key tag or a mug right? now, even if you look at a very simple example of Pizza Hut now the Pizza Hut uh, in the bill itself says uh, you will be getting 15% off uh, for your next bill, uh, that is actually a motivator for you to uh, uh, purchase again, repeat purchase. Then they also tells you that if you go and fill the survey, we will give you 20%. Okay. If you fill that survey, we will give you 20%. Okay. So now that is a that is an incentive for the customer to fill the survey, right? So likewise, there are certain incentives that is being given by marketers and tactics being used in order to get the people to respond or, or basically motivate them to fill the questioning. So these are things that you need to worry about or think about when you are doing the research. Then the next category is contacting the customer. It's 9.30. It, start, it starts with telephone interviews. It starts with telephone interviews. So what happens here is that you basically uh, are contacting customers 
over the phone right customers over the phone and then administering your question here give me a second so here what you do is uh, that you call the customer and then via telephone you will do the interview to gather information that you want but the problem is here also there is no personal contact uh, as a result there is a higher chance that the uh, person at the other end find it little boring or find it little very passive and they may not be really willing to respond to a long call long call right and um, uh, uh, they might uh, basically cut cut it off in the middle and they might think it is a time waster and it is very difficult for you to convince them to continue uh, with the telephone now the other one is personal interviews where uh, the customer or the respondent and you have a personal one to one interview in order to uh, uh, in order to get the information that you need then the next one is about the group interviews now that is where you will get a group of customers uh, at once and then you will try to get the, get the feedback give me a second right uh, sorry about it so the the next one is about per, uh, the group interviews where you get a group of customers and you try to get their uh, feedback as a group right then uh, the very recent one that we have come across in under contact methods is social media where you get connected with the customer through social media to gather information right so out of all uh, we will we, it's very important that we talk a little bit more about the interviews so let us now look at it now uh, the most common one that uh, we are, we are talking about is about the focus group interviews right now when you say focus group interviews the interview this is a this is an interview where you get uh, a group of about six uh, people and then uh, actually give them the question that you need to get information and get views of these uh, these people as a group uh, together to understand about the issue in a deeper sense right to have an in-depth understanding so you might get a group of six to ten people you are not going to get uh, 20 30 people here but ideally is a, a number of like six people but you can go up to 10 but I, we don't recommend anybody any 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 number about 10 because then you will not be able to administer the uh, interview right but you also need a very trained interviewer to to have this discussion going because uh, you cannot have a person who has uh, who does, doesn't have that uh, capability or the skill to administer this because the interviewer himself should have both the ability to uh, uh, basically run the discussion towards the objective and at the same time motivate all all participants to give their uh, contribution right so obviously the interviewer conducting this training should have uh, the right capability and the skills to conduct it right so uh, you can talk about a particular product new product or you can do this together uh, insights from customers as to how you should improve your service 
right so all those things can be done in a focus group right uh, so uh, the, the why you are doing the focus group basically to get an in depth understanding unless you need such in depth understanding you need, uh, need not do a, a focus group interview right you can use other areas then uh, another thing uh, that we have uh, found is the delphi technique so if you really look at the focus group it's a group a group discussion that is focused on a particular topic facilitated by a trained interviewer right now on contrary the delphi technique is a structured group communication process where with a panel of experts to formulate a prediction or set of priorities now this is where you actually get a set of experts and then get their feedback in order to decide what is your priority and uh, how you will uh, what is your prediction right now uh, it's not just taking a, a, a normal group but uh, dealing with some experts to formulate predictions or uh, set priorities right so that is the uh, difference between the, the the subtle difference between the group interviews and the delphi techniques right so with that we are moving to uh, the customer interviewing techniques right customer interviewing techniques uh, now when you are conducting an interview it is of course a very uh, very very uh, very serious thing it's not just having a chat right you can't just have to have a chat you must be able to meet your objective by motivating the group and also getting the best out of the person in front of you so it can be a one person person to person or it can be one to many where you have few or few people you have to get the responses now uh, let me tell you about few things that you can do in order to make your interviews more effective the first thing is that you need to develop a rapport between you and the respondent before you go on to ask questions before you go on to ask questions because see when you meet a stranger uh, very rarely you feel like uh, uh, getting open with him right you you have your reservations you have your uh, the stress and you have your like uh, you're not very relaxed to come out uh, the with your real feelings because you are wondering who this person is right so therefore uh, it's important that you build a rapport with the person and how you do that is you are not going to straight away jump into the uh, jump into the uh, question or the subject matter you're going to talk with him about several things around uh, and and general general things the normal things right so you might talk to him about uh, uh, the the cricket match you might talk to him about the weather right you might talk to him about uh, something that has uh, current news or, or topic that he likes right if he's a football fan about football if he's a cricket fan about cricket right but obviously not the sensitive parts like the race religion right so you might you will talk about general things and then you will try to basically develop a rapport and find out a common ground uh, for example uh, he may be from your school or he may be from your uh, country he may be from your village or something there is a common ground to find that and whatever it is during this particular section you are trying to make the person feel comfortable feel comfortable and relax and to open his mind or basically open up with you right so that is where you build the repo second you need to make sure that you ask clear questions and single questions now your questions need to be exactly clear as to what you really want and it should focus on obtaining a one one objective one object you can't be asking too many things in a in a question right it has to be very simple and straightforward right you can't uh, you might say okay uh, are you happy will you come again no no those are two questions i you must ask okay are you happy he will say yes I, yes so no when you ask will you come again it's a different question are you are you happy and will you come again you can't put it into a one question right so it has to be two questions so question should be 
focused on getting one response, right? And then the next question, and it has to be very clear, right? Then, uh, then you need to basically try as much as possible to use open-ended questions rather than going for yes or no questions, right? Because when you go for yes or no questions, they will they will just say yes or no, but you don't know the extent of it, right? You don't know the extent of it. Uh, for example, if you ask them, "Are you satisfied?" They will say yes, even they are barely satisfied. Sometimes the person who say, "I'm I'm satisfied," are you satisfied? Yes, maybe delight. Maybe a person who has got delighted with your service, or maybe a person who has just found it is okay, right? But when you say yes, that yes has a huge uh, wide scope that yes can be barely satisfied to uh, highly satisfied delighted right so in uh, now when you ask uh, uh, such a question uh, you might you might not get the real uh, real answer out of it right so therefore you can ask something like uh, what do you think about our, uh, what do you think about our service right now that he will go on talking right so that's a very open ended question right what do you think about our service now that is an open ended question where he will talk about okay what he thinks and what are the good things he found what are the bad things he found so you can get a better idea than asking uh, uh, whether our service is good or bad right so uh, that is how it goes right so uh, the next one is uh, generally we say ask experience related questions before opinion question for example uh, you might say uh, uh, question number one you can ask describe the process you followed in obtaining a credit card so he will describe his experience right okay i came with an application this is how i get got it and he will talk about his experience so he will talk about the process and his experience then you will ask a second question how do you feel about the process now this is a uh, this is a opinion related question how you feel about the process then he will say okay based on his experience how you feel about the process now you can ask the reverse type reverse way if you ask how do you feel about the process and then tell describe the process it is not going to work right so you must make sure that you first ask the experience related question where he will uh, talk about his experience and then uh, ask him the opinion question so that it will be easy for the respondent to answer the second question next one is that you have to put the your questions in a sequence right uh, questions which are very general uh, uh, and uh, to very specific right from general to specific broad to narrow right? then the next one is that you need to probe or follow up questions because when you talk when you probe means you you ask questions and try to understand the facts around it right so sometimes the customer might tell you uh, uh, for example he might say okay i am satisfied but looking at the tone looking at the body language you might find that he has something in between lines so here you uh, so you so you must again keep on asking from him okay uh, how satisfied you are are you really delighted or you are you are just okay with the service what so likewise then then we will talk more so like you have to ask the questions why uh, why 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 and then basically probe so that you can get the real feedback from the customer instead of a very narrow straightforward feedback which is a yes or a no right then the next one is that you need to avoid sensitive questions you should never ask very sensitive questions which make the person embarrassed or which makes the make which which arouses the feelings of the person like anger sadness uh or the, the 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 anxiety you must not ask such questions from him right and then uh, the next one is you must keep the control of the whole discussion it's very important because otherwise the discussions will go uh, to different directions uh, we call it the derailing so you want to go towards a particular objective but in the middle the whole discussion will go to a totally a different area so as an interviewer you must keep control and if the discussion is going towards a different area you should be able to drag the discussion back on the track to uh, go for your objective the next one is you need to interpret the answers right you need to interpret the answers the what the customer say uh, sometimes you might not get it very clearly 
so very important that you uh, when, a, when a customer say something to you you interpret it using your knowledge and uh, the experience so these are things you can do to make your uh, interviews much better right now another method that you find is online market research now this is where you try to collect primary data through internet surveys and online focus group discussions right so uh, uh, here you are talking about uh, uh, like uh, uh, surveys that you have in the internet where you you can open it out to the entire global uh, uh, global market right you don't the internet is such a thing where it doesn't uh, talk about geographical barriers so by being in colombo you you can even uh, do a research on the behavior patterns in uh, so sorry you can do a research using the people uh, around the world or around the country through the internet right so there are surveys that, there are sites which allows you to do that uh, and basically develop your questionnaire in the site itself and gather information then you can also have online panels now rather than having physical meetings with the people and the interviews you can have online meetings where you gather people from different geographical areas sometimes being in colombo you might get some people from uk usa uh, in europe countries to join with you uh, to uh, get information so that those facilities are available now so that if, if you are if you are an exporter and you are exporting tea to russia you don't have to go to russia now to do a research sometimes you can get them online and get their uh, in, get information you can even now have online focus group discussions where you have a, a, a set of people like 6 to 10 people and have a forum and uh, do that and also you now have the social media where you can do uh, research right now social media is an interesting area because uh, it 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 is actually giving lot of information about people and each time you divulge your uh, your uh, your data to another party you uh, you your data is been extracted to learn about you now there has been a very interesting uh, story about a particular political campaign where the social media gathered profile information of different people and they used totally different messages for them analyzing their personality and which are very fitting for example if you are a person who will talk uh, about uh, if you have a lot of uh, comments about a particular religion for example so let's say that you are a person who, who in the fb talk a lot of lot of things about buddhism this particular person will send you a message saying what he will do to the progress of the buddhism but if you are a person who has talked too much about uh, christianity he will send you a very specific message talking about that if you are a, a person who are in banking he will he will send you a message which is very personalized which talks about banking and what he will do to the bank so likewise uh, how the personalized messages have been developed by uh, getting the profiles of the people now that is something that has happened and even the companies do it the companies will go through your profile and see okay this guy is a prospect for a phd this person is a prospect for a mba this person is a prospect for a uh, high value how a high value product premium product so let us send a personalized message for him and when when sending the message they will know what color to use what what pictures to use what appeal is most effective to you now these are all things that uh, can be gathered in social media now if you are thinking it is fiction it is not it is the reality there are companies who are working with these social media networks and gathering information about uh, the profiles of their customers and developing personalized messages uh, for them which actually is more effective than a general message which you send out right so that when the when the message comes they feel it is actually written to them this product is for me kind of a feeling will come right so that is the power of social media research and sometimes you might even feel it now if you go and search about a particular uh, for example if you have searched about click the 
uh, an advertisement on uh, on uh, education you will start getting a lot of information about education throughout right and if you have watched the video sometimes in youtube on a particular area you may be getting information related to it if you have shared a particular post that another person has shared you may be getting information related to it now you may be wondering how it is happening because there is always a gathering of data about you in social media so social media is such a tool where marketers are now using to uh, manipulate uh, not we can't say manipulate we will say customize uh, the 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 offerings they have right so those are uh, methods where we can talk about how to connect with people right fine so uh, now we have uh, discussed about the research uh, approaches and also we have discussed about the uh, uh, research uh, contact methods right the next one is to talk about sampling next one is to talk about sampling now this is this is some area where most of the students mess it up so therefore you i, I suggest that you give a good uh, attention to this and try to grab it uh, then and there now in a research uh, basically you can't uh, ask questions from everyone now that's not going to work because if you if you, now for example if you are talking about uh, uh, a research on customers in banking area you can't be asking customers in in this in sri lanka all the customers about uh, their behavior patterns towards uh, or basically their responses towards banking products now that's not going to work you may you may have to spend hours and hours and days and days and you might not finish the research right so therefore in in research there is nothing called that you are going to ask from everybody what what, what their feeling is or what, what their response is now instead of that what you do is that you take select a particular sample and you ask questions now then again you might come across a, come across a, an, a, a, a question now when you have uh, let's say 100 people by taking uh, 20 people or 50 people how can we get an idea now the research uh, the, the the theory behind it is this for example i will keep on asking from you uh, whether uh, whether you like to uh, now for example let's say the colombo crowd where, whether you will like to go to a branch or use internet banking now when i keep asking this uh, some might say yes no yes no yes no yes no and after a particular level the percentage between yes no will not change now if the yes is 20 and no is uh, uh, 80 then this 2080 might vary at the beginning in a bigger big way right but after some time let's say you when you are asking from the hundredth person that when you get the hundredth person's response this 2080 may, may not change now if you keep on asking even from 500 people sometimes you might find it is same as the result that you have got when you were when you have interviewed 100 people now that is the theory so when you go on asking from people after a particular level the response will be same there is no big big variation no no big variation right it will be almost same so uh, if the answer is 2080 uh, when it comes to 100 responses we are not bothered to get a 19 and uh, 81 inquiring 500 people so that 400 uh, i mean out of by inquiring even 400 people you, your your response has changed only by one person so who, who cares right so there's no point so therefore uh, sometimes you might say okay we don't have to inquire 500 people we can inquire 100 people and come to an understanding about the feelings or the response or the thinking patterns of the entire 500 people so uh, if you really look at this particular diagram you see something called population now population is total number of people 
that you are going to uh, you are going to research on right so let's say that this is your customer base right? now if you try to answer ask questions from this customer base it's a it's a huge effort and it takes a lot of time right so what you do here is that out of this customer base you take a sample now for example here you have taken five people right you have taken five people and uh, you are thinking when i ask from these five people it will be enough for me to understand about the population about the population and remember this should be a representative sample representative sample that means this should be a, an adequate sample it should have adequate number and also it should represent the different people in the population right so it has to be a representative sample right so when you have a representative sample then by doing your research with this sample and getting information from this sample you can get an idea of this entire population right so what you say is the response i get from the sample is almost equal to the response i will get if i do the research with the entire population so that is your argument now that is how the sampling uh, has come in right so population is total number of people that are subjected to your research for example if you are talking about the colombo customers all the customers in colombo right but you are not going to go to all the customers in colombo out of them you will select a group and that is the sample and you will do the research with this sample and then based on the sample response you will come to a conclusion that this sample response is almost equal to the entire colombo customer response that is your entire population so this is the theory right now when you are doing this so when you are when you decide the population okay this is my total number and then when when you are deciding the sample you have few questions you need to ask the question who is to be surveyed what is my sampling unit second how many people should be surveyed right what is the representative number right and then how should people in the sample to be chosen right sampling procedure make in ko homa ma select kala ganne kawada ganne now these are all very valid questions for you to answer right so if you don't answer these questions you can't uh, find a good sample right so uh, under those you have to decide your sampling method right now when it comes to sampling methods you have two types of key sampling methods where i will i will explain this to you in a very simple way so you try to grab it to understand it at once first one is probability sampling right uh, now probability is like everyone has a chance it's a probability right anything can happen right so anyone can come in right so there is a probability so under probability sampling what what it says is there is a chance to everyone to come into the research and there is no biasness in the researcher right the researcher has no biasness in selecting uh, who will be researched it, it is pretty random right any person in the population can come into the research right any person in the population so that's the beauty of it give me a second
right so uh, probability sampling is that everyone in the uh, in the uh, basically uh, the population has an equal chance to uh, come to the research the researcher has no biasness otherwise now the researcher can also have biasness to so the researcher might say okay i will research only one two three i will not take other other people to research now if that happens the research is not independent right for example if you are doing a customer su survey on the customer satisfaction you might select only the people that you have served really well only the people who are really uh, really happy and do the research so when you do that research everybody will say we are happy right so now what has happened the researcher has got biased so there was no uh, there was no chance everyone in the population to come to the research but the researcher has selected uh, what he wants so when that happens there can be manipulations the researcher can really manipulate the whole thing and there is no credibility or independence uh, in the research right so the probability sampling is not like that probability sampling is where everyone has a chance to come in uh, randomly right so most of the time everyone has a has a chance to come into the uh, uh, come into the research right the, the biasness of the researcher is removed here so you have uh, under under probability sampling you have three types random sampling stratified sampling and cluster sampling so when you go to simple random sa sample it, as it says it's a very simple random right simple random sarali ona kenek keno right eta kota metana diwenne from the group you will select someone and there is no basis right there is no basis uh, it can be a b c d uh, it, you will just select there is no no uh, no biasness anybody can come in right it's like you have a set of pebbles in a box and you will just take one pebble out of it and you don't know why you have taken it what it is you just take one right so likewise in a simple random sample you take someone right you just take somebody and then that person will be in the sample the second one is stratified sample now in the stratified sample what you do is you basically divide them into a group and you take someone out of the group randomly right someone out of the group randomly right uh, so that is the difference in the stratified stratified sample in a cluster sample what you do is you cluster people based on some criteria right and based on some criteria you cluster them and out of the cluster you will select a person out of the cluster you will select a person right uh, now that that cluster can be a, uh, can be with people of different nature but uh, there is a, according to particular criteria they are in that right uh, for example in the stratified sample we can talk about that you dividing the sample as men and women right? and you take few from men and few from women right and there is nothing uh, there is no bias in a cluster sample you might say okay uh, the people who are highly educated no not educated right above degree level likewise you can cluster and you can take uh, one out of the cluster and who will be taken out of the cluster that is random and you are not going to decide who but you might cluster it because you are you want to get an idea from all all parts and all types of people right otherwise when you do random sampling you might not get sometimes uh, you might not get uh, different uh, people from different backgrounds you might not get right so to make sure that you get different backgrounds you might cluster right so these are the three methods the other one is non probability sampling now in non probability sampling researcher decides what who will be there in the sample researcher decides so there will be researchers biasness under non probability sample right so researcher will be little bias he will decide who will be selected and based on that he will select the sample so there also you have three types first one is the convenience sample now convenient sample is what most of you do right so when you want to do a research you will basically talk to the people who are very close to you right and uh, who you will approach is the closest person closest person 
most convenient person right it's convenient sample then you have quota sample right basically you cluster them into uh, into uh, or basically out of them you out of a particular group you will take a particular quota okay from these people only 10 from these people this group only five likewise you have a quota and then based on that you do the research then you have judgmental sample now here uh, there's no random you will decide okay for my research i have to take a person who has a qualification above mba and who, who can really talk with me and therefore you decide who to select and you decide what criteria to be used right so the researcher has the choice now why it is important is the researcher will say okay if you get a person who we who may not have at least the mba level knowledge he may not be able to answer to my questions right so that uh, the research will not be very fruitful so therefore but i will select only a person with an mba and who has that capacity to talk right so based on your research question you might go for judgment sample so in all these three samples the key criteria is that there will be biasness from the researcher right so very simple sampling methods you have probability sampling and non probability sampling now in probability sampling everyone in the population has an equal chance to come into the sample but in non probability sampling basically there's research biasness and the researcher will decide uh, basically how he will pick the sample right so that is the difference in that right so uh, uh, in a very simple sense what it is has been uh, has been described in one sentence this is from kotlin armstrong so if you say simple random sample every member of the population has a known and equal chance of selection stratified ran random sample the population is divided into mutually exclusive groups such as age gender etc and random samples are drawn from each group right third one cluster sample the population is divided into mutually exclusive groups such as blocks and the researcher draws a sample of the group to interview then when it comes to non probability sampling you have convenience sample that is the researcher selects the easiest population member from which to obtain information the easiest member langam in the then you have judgment sample the researcher uses his or her judgment to select population members who are good prospects for accurate information right so he decide me anik kata katha karala wedak ne me gena katha karanna nam me wage kenek awashyai e kida man meyawa ganna kiyala eya ema decide karana kawada research ekata ganna then you have quota sample the researcher finds and interviews a prescribed number of people in each uh, quota right uh, give me a second each several categories right so from uh, he put people into categories and then from each category he will take a quota and then uh, he will continue the uh, research right so these are the uh, sampling methods that you get right so right now we, we will take a break from here uh, now it's 10 10 uh, 10 10 and we'll take about 20 minutes break and we'll try to meet up at 10 30 right so 10 30 so you take a 20 minute break and come back we will need to finish the research session today and start the other one because we uh, we only have now uh, four more classes right so we'll try to finish it uh, today okay so we'll meet up again at 10 30. <coughs> excuse me sir yes so uh, i have one question uh, yeah, can you please tell me the difference of stratified sampling and cluster sampling yes we will discuss it so uh, after the break we will have a chat and we will uh, discuss the difference between them yeah, sure, sure. thank you very much. thank you Dilusha. right uh, welcome back so uh, we were discussing about sample and i think gavin had a question on uh, the sampling and that is the the difference between cluster sample and stratified sample uh, 
uh, right gaming is is that a question so i raised the question sir yeah yeah uh, 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 who raised the question is it gaming no delusion delusion ah delusion 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 your, your question is the, the difference between the rust and uh, the stratified sample right yeah what's the main difference like what, what distinguishes cluster from stratified sample right right let's say this now the cluster is basically you are looking at uh, 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 putting in they putting them into blocks your population into blocks for example now if you are trying to do a trans uh, the, do a research on uh, sri lanka uh, now what you do is you look at uh, you have to look at uh, basically cluster it into some way so you might uh, look at uh, clustering it in in terms of uh, uh, districts right Wait a second. So you might uh, look at it as districts, and you might say, okay, Sri Lanka has twenty-five districts, right? So uh, you you look at it as twenty-five districts. So you have put it into twenty-five blocks. Now you can't. Let's say that you can't run entire twenty-five districts. So you might say, okay, out of these twenty-five uh, clusters, I will select five clusters, and in that five clusters. anybody can come into the sample right so that is one so basically you you create blocks and then you try to uh, take people randomly out of those blocks right uh, in a in a uh, stratified sample what you do is you put them into mutually exclusive groups based on some criteria for example if you use uh, gender so you might say uh, girls and boys right so if you have uh, uh, girls a particular number and boys uh, let's say 30 boys and 70 girls then uh, what you do is you take 14 girls and 6 boys uh, uh, from the girls you take 14 and boys you take 6 so that is the proportionate because you have 30 boys and 70 70 girls so then when you take the sample it actually represents the uh, 100 number and the difference of gender as well right so there is a there are 100 people and out of those 30 boys 70 girls so when you are selecting the sample to represent it accurately you might take six boys to represent the 30 and there are 70 girls so you might say 14 girls to represent the 70 so you have a sample of 20 and that 20 sample has equal representation from the population so that is one one example so you can, you can also do a stratified sampling based on age now for example you will say okay let's uh, now there are 100 people now uh, in this 100 uh, people there are different age levels so let's take uh, below 10 uh, 10 to 20 20 to 30 likewise you might cluster it based on age and then uh, draw a sample right so then in, in clustering you basically take a criteria and you divide the sample into mutually exclusive divide the population into mutually exclusive groups and you take a random sample so randomly pick out of those clusters to create your sample in a, in a cluster sample what you do is basically you cluster the society or cluster the population and select out of those clusters and uh, there's nothing called like you have created a, a specific criteria out of it it's just that you have clustered it into sections and then you take Uh, people randomly out of those sections selecting the required clusters i hope you got some idea about it. yes sir right. thank you very much sir okay right so uh, let's try to move forward i am trying to finish the research topic today so you have uh, the next one is that we have research instruments right so now we have discussed three things first one is we have discussed research approach so under research approach we talked about observational research experimental research experiments and then we talked about survey research second we talked about contact methods right and third we talked about sampling now fourth is research instruments right research instrument so okay what is a research instrument a research instrument is a tool used to collect data related to the research right so research instruments can be tests surveys scales 
questionnaires, uh, even checklists, right? So uh, the most most common research instruments used uh, by the students and the researchers are uh, the questionnaires and mechanical devices. So uh, let me talk about a questionnaire. Now remember, you can't set a questionnaire just for the sake of putting questions, right? So you can't just put some questions and develop a questionnaire. That questionnaire should be designed with due care. Then only whatever information you gather can be analyzed. Because I remember even in, in when I was doing my MBA, there was a person who has done uh, developed a questionnaire, and he has not actually consulted its supervisor. He has collected the uh, he has distributed and collected questions, and when it comes to the statistical analysis, there is no no method he can use to analyze this questionnaire because this questionnaire is developed in such a way that none of the methods can be used. So he has to do his entire uh, questionnaire and the research again, right? So this is this is the uh, this is the problem. So if you don't uh, design it in a, in a proper manner, then you may not be able to analyze whatever you get, and you might not get the information you require. So you have to be very clear as to what you want, or and also whether you can really analyze the information that you gather out of the question. By using an accepted statistical method, right? So therefore, developing a question is not just some, something that you can do by sitting and putting questions that is coming to your mind. It has to be done in a very methodical way, right? Uh, and uh, the purpose of the questionnaire is to gather actually the data from the target audience. So you can have different types of questions, which actually requires different types of uh, analysis and uh, which has different types of objectives. For example, open-ended questions, where you might be able to get uh, uh, the real feelings and uh, more descriptive answers from the customers, like what do you think about our service? What do you think we can do to improve our uh, quality? Right. So those are very open-ended, so that they, you allow them to talk. Right. Uh, even a training, you might say, okay, uh, instead, of the, instead of asking whether the training is good or bad, Yes or no? Uh, you can ask. What do you think about the training? What are your suggestions? How can we improve? And so those are things that make the person come out of it his real feedback, right? <clears throat> then you have close close-ended questions, very straightforward questions where you can ask uh, whether this is good or bad, right or wrong, right? Uh, correct or incorrect. Right? So very very straightforward questions. Those are very close-ended. So then uh, there's only one. Uh, one answer that you have to select. You can't give explanations, right? <clears throat> but in a in a good question, you should be able to wish good question here. You will be able to use a blend of these questions where you can get a very straightforward answer uh, for straightforward uh, facts that you require. And at the same time, you can have open-ended questions to get a much deeper understanding about uh, about uh, the customer feedback, right? Now, when developing question uh, questions, you can uh, you can have different types of questions coming in. So, one type is dictomus questions. Now, these are questions uh, where the responses can answer in one of the two ways, right? So, they 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 don't describe it. There are only two two answers where he has to select one. For example, do you use internet banking? So when you say, do you use internet banking? There is no other answer. I have to say yes or no. <clears throat> yes or no, right? So it's those are called dictomus questions. Then you have multiple choice questions. Uh, uh, now these questions actually gives a range uh, to the, the to the customer for him to give his real real feedback, right? Now, for example, we might say, okay, I am happy. Okay, to what extent you are happy? Right? I'm satisfied. Okay, to what extent you are satisfied? Right? So uh, that 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 is there. Now, for example, uh, a question can be: Rate your experience in using our internet banking facility. Rate your experience in using our internet banking facility. So he can say excellent, 
but oh very good oh good these are three different feelings excellent means he is delighted right very good means that this is something more than he has expected good means that okay it has met my expectation uh, or uh, it's, it's little beyond my expectation oh fair fair go or right okay sadar okay very good the good then another good then oh poor or we can say even very poor right so likewise uh, you can get a give a scale and identify really what he feels now if you ask a dictomus question here it's not going to work uh, uh, work is the experience with our internet banking good or bad so you might say good but you don't know whether he is telling uh, very good excellent or good or fair right uh, he might say bad okay in what level is it bad is it poor or very poor right so uh, the uh, so the, this uh, multiple choice questions actually helps you to uh, understand things little better right then uh, you have uh, open ended questions now open ended question uh, is kind of a question where the respondent is given given a free space like he he can freely answer the question and come out of its uh, real feelings and thoughts and uh, he is given the chance to express himself right for example a question can be what do you think about our internet banking facility now when you say what do you think about our internet banking facility then that allows him to talk about it right so he might talk about it experience what he felt uh, and then what what he think right so he will come out of his real uh, feedback about your internet banking so uh, these three types of questions can be used in your questionnaire uh, dictomus questions multiple choice questions and open ended questions right and how you analyze these three types the responses are also pretty different right so therefore you have to uh, be very careful when it comes to analysis <clears throat> so this is about questionnaires the other factor that you use is mechanical devices right so you can have mechanical devices and decide okay uh, what, what is the response right so for example uh, now here uh, when these people are shopping uh, you have this face recognition tool where it talks or talk where it tells you okay what kind of a age level this person is right the gender and whether the person is feeling happy bad sad angry and kind of things like that right so you you will see okay where when where at where what is the feeling of the customers who are coming into your shopping mall and uh, which makes them really happy which they make makes them really angry uh, so all those things can be identified through mechanical devices now again this is a mechanical device where they wear and go and see brands and uh, you can see okay they are their eye movements they are thinking patterns the brain brain uh, signals when they uh, when they are trying to choose products and they when they look at different types of products right so uh, this uh, these are mechanical devices which is used uh, to understand the uh, shoppers right for example uh, checkout scanners to re record purchase of a shopper advertisers can use eye cameras right to study eye movements of beavers while they uh, watch advertisements so what is their eye movement and based on the eye movement what is their feeling and then neuromarketing measures uh, brain activity to learn how consumers feel and respond to market offerings for example i think the last week i uh, played a video for you and in that video they said like they did uh, they did a research now they said the coca cola is a sensational brand and uh, when people get coca cola uh, there is a particular part of the brain that gets stimulated and uh, that is captured and that part is talking about joy happiness right so Uh, the Coca-Cola brand positioning is also that it's about happiness, right, and enjoyment and the good feeling. And and uh, when they take a Coca-Cola bottle, uh, now before they drink, that part is stimulated. So that is found through uh, through the, uh, the the mechanical devices, right. 
so this is uh, this is actually an era uh, research area where now it is moving very heavily and and people are really uh, moving into this area uh, neuro marketing uh, neuroscience uh, and marketers are now moving into this methodology the scientific advancement in order to make their market offers the products look more attractive more customized to the customers and then to understand the customer behavior response towards their uh, towards their appeals towards their advertisement campaigns and uh, towards their products uh, the the real feeling right and it is not something the customer says but captured by the devices right so uh, what 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 really their brain is telling what what kind of feelings they get now this is an area uh, that is developing the use of mechanical devices to track uh, the responses so basically you can you can really uh, explore this area such a wonderful uh, area for you to learn right and then now you you go to implement in the research plan now there you talk about collecting information right so here what you do is that you basically uh, now you have come to the methods you know how to contact the methods so you use those and you basically uh, gather data right you collect information you collect data and then the second part is that you need to process the information or the data that you have collected right so basically you can collect the data put on to the excel sheets cluster it and then prepare it and then you analyze the information then you can use statistical tools and analyze the information for example somebody has say uh, they might talk to you about the different scales and then you have to find out exactly what is the uh, response from the customer right what do they really telling about it right so uh, that is the analysis part right so here the analysis part is critically important because you might gather a lot of information and data but when it comes to this part analyzing information uh, the human brain comes in right so unless you have good analysis and uh, uh, the people who can really analyze data using their brains then you might not get the real picture now this is where i talk to you about that famous example and uh, you might go to a particular uh, there, there was this person who went to the jungle uh, uh, to a distance village he gathered all the data and he came out with an analysis saying that there is no market because no market for slippers or shoes because none of them use it the other uh, person came out with an answer said that none of them use it because and there is a huge potential for us to uh, market slippers and shoes so two different analysis same data same information but uh, two people analyzed it in two different ways but uh, when it comes to analysis i believe the human brain is much better compared to the competitor uh, compared to the computers because the computers will analyze based on what you have inputted and the program given but it has no no agility to change its analytical capacity with the context now this is where most of the credit decision uh, engines uh, will have problems right so you might come up with ai engines where you have uh, basically given all the information related to taking a credit decision and what you do is you input all the data to the machine and then you ask the machine to come to a decision the machine may give the decision based on the rules given but machine does not have any idea what is happening in the marketing environment or business environment right so he might say okay uh, giving a, a big loan to a person uh, who is an agent of fertilizer is good but unless you feed the machine that there is a fertilizer ba ban he will not uh, understand right? unless you get an idea saying okay there is a problem with the tourism industry and it will not boom so now it's all prediction right so you might some people say okay the tourism will grow tourism will not grow right so all are, all are things that you have to uh, i mean basically come out uh, using your brain and analytical capacity 
but the, the computer will not do that. The computer will ask you, tell me whether it will grow or not. So if you say grow, all the decisions will be based on that. So computer is a predetermined uh, program where it cannot have that agility to change the context. So this is where the human brain has the advantage over uh, computer when it comes to this analytical part, analyzing information. So uh, sometimes a company may have good research process where both companies will get information, both companies will process information, but who will analyze it better may see different opportunities. Right? So this part is critical when it comes to the research. Right, so if you really look at CRM, by using CRM to understand customer better, companies can provide higher value of customer service and develop deeper customer relationships. Right? So that is the fundamental truth when it comes to CRM, right? They can use CRM to point, pinpoint high value customers, target them more effectively, cross-sell companies' product, and create offers tailored to specific customer requirements. So CRM has a strong link between marketing information. So CRM system of a company is part of gathering data, gathering information, and also using information to be more proactive rather than reactive, right? So CRM and marketing information goes hand in hand and it, it serves both ways like CRM will gather information at the same time, it uses the information to stay proactive uh, in the business. Right. Now, when you are talking about CRM, marketing information and data gathering, uh, certain terms are there which you need to understand with the change of technology. So one of those is data warehouse. Right. So, so I was looking at oracle.com and uh, found this information. A data warehouse uh, is, is a kind of a data management system which is designed to support business intelligence, right? Uh, the analytics. So uh, this, this particular data warehouse will get information from various sources. Their CRM system, ERP system, their files, other data sources, Right, external sources, so and so. So they, they get all this information to their uh, data warehouse, to database, right? So this data warehouse, it's 11 one part is gathering data and storing them. And this other part, or the second, second part of it is providing reports when needed, providing analytics when needed. And in order to do that, do proper data mining, right? Do proper data mining to find out what the data requirements or the information requirements of the company from the database. Right? So uh, that is the part of the, that is how the data warehouses work, right? Uh, so uh, a data warehouse, if you take, it's a centralized uh, database, right? Which consists large amount of data from multiple sources. Its analytical capabilities allow organization to drive, derive valuable business insights from their data to improve decision making. So you have the data and it might give you valuable insight. For example, uh, your data might tell you, okay, based on the customer behavior pattern, this customer will, uh, will go abroad in the next month. So he, they will tell you and they might tell you, okay, out of this database, this much of customers will go shopping uh, in the Christmas. Their shopping uh, will increase. Or it might tell you, okay, based on the customer behavior patterns in the past, he will, during the Christmas, he will go to these, these, these places. So if you give discounts at these outlets, he will value it more. So such business insights it can give you right? from the from segment level to uh, individual customer level, right? So it says again over time it builds a historical record. So it collects information and you have a historical record that can be invaluable to data scientists and business analysts 
because of these capabilities a data warehouse can be considered an organization single source of truth right so this is uh, i have extracted from the oracle.com right and then uh, uh, if you ask what is the difference between a simple database that is used and a data warehouse so if you look at a simple database it is storing real time information about a business right? and it is supporting actually daily transactions and the, the routine requirements right? and uh, and it has massive amount of volume of data and very simple queries simple queries are for, uh, put to the database for example uh, it might uh, record deposits made atm withdrawals and then we'll give you uh, sometimes it will give you a very simple answer to a query like uh, what is the total amount of deposits made per day right what is the total amount of withdrawals per day in an atm so likewise very simple information can be provided from a database right and it actually records day to day uh, information now if you look at the data warehouse it is not a database it is actually a kind of a uh, system first thing is it gathers data from different sources right from from the marketing platforms from the accounting platforms from the it platforms from the sales platforms from the networks of dealers the intermediaries network of suppliers from the erp systems so it is connected to different information sources of the organization and it gathers information from all these sources right and uh, basically those are those are put in a very organized manner for reporting and analysis and you can call very complex queries from data warehouses rather than very simple queries like what is the total amount of withdrawals right and uh, it will help you take business decisions so uh, because the data warehouse is gathering data from multiple sources and has lot of historical data uh, it will provide you uh, basically it, you can basically use it to have a more complex uh, information than uh, what you can get from a database for example you can think of okay segmenting customers based on their past transaction you can uh, do like predicting customer churn you might say okay this customer is more uh, more there's more inclination or more probability that this customer will close the account uh, within a week so there's a more probability that this customer will close his card uh, and at the same time even for npa you can say there is a higher probability that this customer will go to npa within the next 3 months so they have don't give you additional credit so such complex decisions can be derived uh, using data warehouses right uh, so it can be used even to forecast forecast the advanced growth deposit growth uh, then potential customers for cross selling up selling uh, instead of total withdrawals you can use data warehouse to analyze withdrawal patterns right so likewise data warehouse gives you more complex answers uh, give you answers to more complex questions compared to a database right so it's not a simple database it's a it's a kind of a uh, system where it gathers data uh, connected to all parts of your organization to gather data and to provide you reports business and uh, intelligence for you to take decisions so in a in a in a data warehouse another very critical word that you come across is data mining right so if you say data mining data mining is a process that will turn raw data into useful information uh, this is done by analyzing data using sophisticated software techniques right and basically you try to uh, analyze patterns uh, and uh, uh, regularities in the structured data right so uh, you can use software and uh, pull out relationships and correlations a correlation is what is the link between two data right so now for example bond bond prices and interest rates have a correlation that is when the interest rates go up 
bond prices will go down when interest rates go down bond prices will go up so when one changes the other one is affected so there's a correlation right? but when the interest rates goes up nothing will happen to bond prices when it goes down nothing will happen to bond prices then there's no correlation so the uh, data mining helps you to look at your whole historical data organization wide data and identify these correlations right and relationships uh, even if you, if you apply to banks banks can learn more about their customers and they can develop ma effective marketing strategies they can see where they can reduce cost uh, optimize usage of resources improve sales now these are these are benefits of data mining which you can do right so uh, in the banking terms or in in, in, in if you really look at how the data mining is used right so the data mining is used sometimes to identify buying patterns right so you have the historical data and then you can okay understand what is the buying pattern now this customer uh, when he will increase his buying uh, what is the usage uh, frequency all these things can be analyzed then analyzing responses to marketing efforts so when there is an advertisement promotion how the what is the reaction right and uh, when there is a pizza hut ad, a pizza hut promotion what is the reaction and what is the cost when it comes to clothing promotion what is the reaction what is the cost right. then uh, then detect frauds right so basically by looking at the transaction patterns abnormalities you can detect frauds then loyalty analysis right how well the loyalty programs are working then spending patterns then understand the desires and likings of the customer so all these are possible with uh, data mining so today uh, the the era has come to a level where every bank has a data warehouse and use data mining uh, to improve their decision making and business intelligence to drive their strategies so with this we have also come across a very new word called data science now data science combine uh, the scientific method maths and statistics specialized programming knowledge advanced analytical skills artificial intelligence and even storytelling to uncover the explain to uncover and explain the business insights buried in data right so you have data and basically the data science is not talking about analyzing data per se but it, it is talking about your use of maths and statistics use of computer science use of uh, business knowledge to come to certain uh, to derive at certain uh, intelligence by using data so it's a, it's a kind of a method where you have data and the data is used uh, using both the business knowledge knowledge on maths and statistics and computer and it knowledge right so uh, this is the this is the new era that is emerging and you have seen lot of courses new courses coming up on data science and we we believe the effective use of data science is the future uh, and uh, the marketing efforts will become more more focused more customized uh, with the use of data science and and uh, one of the principles of crm can be achieved through data science that is becoming proactive right so those who use this will will move before their competitors will move before their competitors so what are the users of data science so there are several users including fraud detection so you can use data science have your algorithms in place now when it comes to the credit card debit cards this is basically used right uh, and these platforms are provided by the international payment schemes visa master and some local vendors so you you basically look at the transaction patterns and then you detect frauds for example if you are if you are generally using uh, 1000 to 5000 rupees uh, daily suddenly when there is a when there is a transaction of 500000 it is triggered and suddenly if you have been using the card in sri lanka and suddenly you have changed to uk without informing or now that is something for to be detected whether it is you or someone else is using and you might look at okay what is the time period 
uh, we, if you have used the card in Sri Lanka, there is no chance that you use within one hour in UK. You can't, you can't go there within one hour, right? So likewise, there are certain uh, rules that have been given and uh, the data is analyzed and then they will detect, they will try to detect frauds before uh, the fraud will become big and the losses will uh, trigger. Then to manage data, to customize approach, personalize offers, right? Rather than general offers which waste your resources. Then even when it comes to risk modeling, right? To have the credit risk modeling where you can analyze uh, the behavior pattern, the credibility, credit worthiness of a person looking at the looking at the data available. Then when it comes to investment risk modeling to understand the risk level of investments uh, based on the data you have. Right? So that is possible. Then uh, even to do customer segmentation. So you can use data science and then uh, come to very effective customer segmentation. Then LTV prediction. LTV here is lifetime value. Right? Lifetime value predictions. Uh, it can give you that insight. And then you can do predictive analysis. Now that is before before uh, something happened, you predict it. For example, you might predict, okay, this customer will uh, become a default customer within another three months. Right? This customer will fly abroad uh, uh, next week, right? So, so let's give him something overseas offer, right? Or offer at the airport, right? Uh, so, likewise, you can do predictive analysis. This is really possible and it is happening, right? And then recommendation engines. So, for example, now this is, this is happening in, in Google, YouTube, uh, Facebook. So, when you use a particular, when you are interested about particular areas, you will keep getting uh videos and suggestions on that particular area so if you go and search neuromarketing continuously you will get similar videos now that is by analyzing your uh, likings and they give you suggestions recommendations and even if you take books they might tell you okay the person who has bought this book has also interested on this or when you want to download apps they will say okay person who has downloaded this set has downloaded this as well so are you interested so kind of things can happen, right? So that is recommendation engines. So these, these are the users of data science. Right? So you can study further on this area. So you might get a question uh, on this area as well on data warehouse, uh, uh, the differences, data mining, data science. So you must have a basic understanding as to what those are and what are the, uh, what are the users of those, right? So uh, better you do a study and then come out as to how you can uh, basically use this uh, new technology in order to improve your CRM efforts, right? CRM efforts. Uh, right, so uh, if you really look at in a very simple sense, uh, apply it to the marketing concept to the CRM concept. Now data science will help you uh, in three areas. First one is custom acquisition. Now that is the first wheel of CRM, right? CRM, I told you there are two wheels. Uh, one is custom acquisition, other one is custom retention. So first wheel is custom acquisition. So data science can help you on that by improving credit quality and reduce credit risk because it can give you analysis about a person that you are trying to give a credit facility. And it can also give you more effective lead generation uh, and it might uh, look at your database and tell you these are prospective customers for you to cross sell this, upsell these products. So those suggestions they will give. So that will help you in acquiring clients. Then the second, it will help you to improve share of wallet, right? So you improve efficiency in marketing efforts by customizing and tailor-made, uh, by having tailor-made uh, appeals offers. Then uh, it will include, it will help you to increase cross-sell, upsell ratios with predictive analysis, right? And that will help you to share, improve share of wallet, right? Then the third factor, the second wheel of the CRM, that is the customer retention. So uh, this, this data science will help you to identify the churn rates and the probabilities and to approach such clients even before they call you to cancel their accounts or the cards and see how to retain them. Second, 
it will also provide you information to improve satisfaction level of the customers so that uh, basically you can offer them what they really need what they really require what they really value and also capture their satisfaction and see how to improve them uh, improve the satisfaction so if you really try to apply data science into crm you might find that data science is helping in all all areas uh, to from customer acquisition to customer retention to increase the profitability of the customer by improving share of wallet right so if a question comes to you as to the use of data warehouse sorry use of data science and uh, how the application of same uh, with crm you can approach such a question uh, in this way by sh showing the link right so uh, uh, there was this article by graham kenny in the harvard business review where he said data is great but it is not a replacement of for uh, talking to customers right so uh, i have found few a few uh, paragraphs out, out of this article the first one says <clears throat> when toyota wanted to develop a luxury car for the united states its team didn't hunker down in tokyo to come up with the perfect design nor did it sit through database obtained from existing toyota customers about current toyota models instead it sent its designers and managers to california to observe and interview the target customers an american male high income executive to find out what he wanted in a car this knowledge combined with its undoubted engineering excellence resulted in a completely new direction for toyota a luxury export to the united states you will know it better as the lexus listening to the customer is now embedded in toyota culture right so what it says is you can find out data looking at the databases information sources but it will never replace uh, you going and talking to a customer and gathering data because that is much more important than you relying on your data right uh, so provided your data is not precisely inaccurate employ modern computer power to examine patterns in your customers buying behavior but understand big data's limitations the data is historic and static so what you have is, as data is historic and static for example you might have data about a customer who has been running a small tourist hotel so his historical data is excellent but it is not telling you how he will fare next year because the context has changed it's historic because it's about the past so data is data information you have in the database is about the past your customers have most likely moved on from what the data captures right so the data has captured certain information but maybe the customer has moved to the next level and data is static because as with any computer modeling it can never answer a question that you didn't think to ask right so basically whatever the computer do you should have inputted it to the computer with a command so if you have not done that it, it can't think of on his own right so the real insights come from seeing the world through someone else's eyes you will only ever get that by truly engaging with customers and listening to their stories so as much as we value data data science data warehouse what it can do the the don't ever forget the value of meeting customers talking to them listening to them and understanding them on top of data uh, whatever the uh, technology influences so that is something i would like to leave with you uh, when i am ending this research because we talk too much about Uh, too much about technology when it comes to the research arena information arena 
but uh, the traditions or traditional methods also have their value in it right so always remember uh, this right this is very important so that is one of the reasons uh, some of the companies some of the banks even who has relied too much on data for example uh, there was uh, a bank who relied on their credit ai engine and uh, they allowed the ai engine to decide uh, limits right so the limits were decided and it was given and they drastically failed because uh, and the data that is entered may not be accurate it may not be accurate data that is entered may be true but it may not be true next for the in, for the future like the fertilizer business person right so therefore uh, the ai engines or whatever the, the technology can only give you results based on what how you have programmed it and whether you enter right data or not if you have entered wrong data inaccurate uh, not reliable data then answers are also not reliable not accurate so it depends on the data that is being entered and how it has been programmed and remember you can never think of its own and adjust to the context or predict the uh, the, the contextual changes okay. because uh, it's not human right so this is very important when it comes to uh, uh, yeah basically doing research and uh, working with marketing intelligence right so there are some uh, some articles i would like to leave with you what i will uh, do is uh, i'll basically post this in the chat and i suggest that you go through these articles i'm not going to take uh, basically print outs and upload but i'm going to uh, send these links to you uh, so what you should do is basically you should download these articles and read and that is where you get more information about what we have just discussed right so i will uh, i will try to do this and these articles are all uh, how the practically what we have discussed how they are practically applied right uh, so let me post all these things in your chat so you can download it right. uh, give me a second uh, right um, that's another one okay fine so with this we can uh, basically mark the end of uh, the the research section right this is section section uh, right so uh, uh, let's have a small chat uh, whether your understanding here whether you have any any issues related to what we have discussed uh, chaminda what do you think any issues or anything that you would like to clarify with me on what we have discussed uh, dilshani how about you are you clear um, yes sir the area is clear to me right dilusha any questions dilusha Delusion. Gavin, you have any questions? Why? Okay. All good, sir. All yeah. Raja Karuna, how about you? Any questions? Why are you clear? Yes, sir. Well understood. Fine, fine, fine. So I, I'm sure that everything is okay with you. So. Uh, next uh, session we are going to take up is uh, on service quality management so uh, let me let me now i am in a different environment so let me now try to play that uh, video i was trying to play now you need to give me feedback uh, basically uh, let me know whether this is clear to you and you are okay and if not we will not uh, continue we will move on to the other. So one of the principles that I developed years ago, we still teach, is 
how about it if i play that video will it, will, it, will you be able to capture it or you can't We can hear, sir. We can hear. You can, you can hear, yeah? Yeah, that, that here? Yeah. Right, so then I'll try to share that. Right? It's called TPR. Mm -hmm. What it stands for is take personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. but the way we teach it is we say, look, blaming other people it's a natural human thing. Let's not pretend it doesn't happen. It's, it's just, just that it, it doesn't, doesn't help. help. Mm -hmm. Feeling a sh so, so one, one of the principles, principles that I developed here is called we still teach, teach is called, called TPR. Mm -hmm. what, what it stands, stands for is take personal, personal responsibility. responsibility. Mm -hmm. and the way we teach, teach it is we say, look, look blaming, blaming other people, it's a natural, natural human thing. thing. Let's, Let's not pretend it doesn't happen. It's just that it doesn't help. Mm. Feeling, feeling ashamed, ashamed. Oh, I, know, I, I can't believe, believe I made, I made the, the same mistake. mistake. It's, it's a, a natural, natural human feeling, feeling but, but it doesn't make anything better. better. And, and having, having an excuse, excuse well, well, you know, you, know, you have, have to hear my story, story also doesn't, doesn't help. help. You, you step, step over the line to what we call TPR, then you're, you're looking at the world going, going okay, okay, what can I do? What step can I take? Maybe it's just changing my own mood. Maybe it's reaching out to help somebody. Maybe it's saying thank you. Maybe it's going to learn something. But, but beyond, beyond TPR is CSR. CSR. But CSR, CSR is, not is not corporate social, social responsibility, where you make a lot of money and then philanthropically you give some of it away to charity. I'm not saying that's wrong. It's, it's just, just that that's, that doesn't that work, work anymore. anymore. You know, you know consumers, consumers are seeing right through that. that. You know, okay, you made your money exploiting the environment, but then you gave it to a charity. Uh-uh, doesn't work anymore. Get out of fossil fuels. Okay? CSR to me is create shared responsibility. So, so you'll be, be the person that reaches, reaches out, out to your colleagues and says, hey, how about, about we do this? You'll you be, be the, the one that mobilizes the family to say, what should we do about recycling? You'll be, be the one that reach out to your neighbors and say, hey, you know what? There's a new family that just moved in across the street. And, you know, English is not the native tongue. And why don't we be more welcoming? Why don't we, you know, extend ourselves as a we? Create shared responsibility. And the, and the third, third level beyond, beyond that is to actually generate historic responsibility. responsibility. Where, Where, you know, you know I'm, I'm not saying everybody has to do this, this but you, you locate yourself in life as a person who can actually, it's you know, 11.30, who can help create something that will endure beyond you. Maybe not exactly the way you thought it was going to be, but you don't just drift. You commit and you contribute to an inflection in the future. Right. I think uh, I think that, that was clear, right? So, so I've, got I've got my essay written, written and, and I've been working, working on it for about, about a week. week. So, so now, now I'm going to show, show you how I use Was it clear to all of you? Yeah, sir. Um, can you try uh, muting your mic? I think it uh, like you can hear the, this thing twice. Ah, yes, okay. I, uh, okay. So, I, so I, I'll do that with the next clip. Fine. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah. But uh, you 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 uh, you you managed to listen to the previous one. Yeah, right? it was good. Right. Yeah, it was good. Okay, let me let me do that. Fine. Then uh, I have another one to show you. Now, the action steps that you design and you Okay, 
Okay, good. Come on back. So let's do a test. Leadership. What does it mean to be a service? leadership. What, what does, does it mean to be a service leader in an organization that is committing itself to differentiating from the competition by building an uplifting service culture? A culture where everybody's taking action to create more value for somebody else, whether it's an external customer or an internal colleague in the same department or in another department. That roof, the place that I put leadership at the top, I put it there because if there is a leak, if you have a great foundation and you put all the building blocks in place and you create a solid culture, but the roof leaks, what happens to the house? It rots, it damages, it eventually collapses and falls down. So let's take a look at this issue of service leadership, your role, your job. The seven rules of service leadership. Now, leadership can be expressed at any level. You don't have to be somebody who's the managing director or the CEO or the executive vice president in order to take the lead in service. Why do I say that? Well, certainly people who are in that position have a lot of ability, a lot of authority, a lot of role, position to be able to lead the organization. But is it also possible for someone who's at the front line to take the lead in responding to a customer situation and say, I'll be your champion for that inside the bank. Is that possible? Absolutely. And they don't need to be the boss. Is it possible for anyone to take the lead in setting the mood for their department for the day? Right? Can't you just deliberately walk in one day and say, good morning, how are you? Nice to see you. Now, people may think you're a little strange, but you could actually take the lead. You don't need to be the leader in order to take the lead in service. Very, very important point. Now, the seven rules of service leadership are specific behaviors that I've noticed great leaders of service organizations consistently do. And here's what the seven are. Let's, let's take a look at them, and then you'll have a chance to discuss at your table. So number one, declaration is what makes new things possible. In the United States, it was called the Declaration of Independence. When somebody says, I now declare you husband and wife, it changes the world. When the judge says guilty or not guilty, it's a declaration, it's it, right? So a leader in an organization like yours needs to be the one who declares service is now a top priority. Well, that's important when you're looking to change the culture of an organization that has been known for sales, or has been known for speed or productivity or has been known only for product innovation, or operational excellence, or safety. Anytime we go to work with an organization that wants to shift and become differentiated and known for outstanding service culture, then the senior leaders have to make that a clear declaration. Is that a behavior of yours? Would staff say that about you? Let's pause for a moment. Talk to the person across the table. Think and be honest. If we were to check to all the people who report to you, would they say that you say that service is a top priority? Or would they say, yeah, the boss deals with that, but only if it's a problem, only when a customer has a complaint? Be honest. Ready? Talk to the person across the table. What would your team say about you? Rule number two, service leadership. Rule number two, be a great 
role model, walk the talk. You know the expression, action speaks louder than words. So if you're doing rule number one, declare, declare, but then they look and see what you actually do, and you're not actually behaving that way, then all the words go out the window. Hmm? Now, at the end of the program today, I'll give you some very specific examples of things that you can do that are walk the talk so that your staff see that you actually believe it. They hear the words you say, they watch the things that you write, they notice how you are with somebody when they're upset, they see how you spend your time. What would be one example of somebody in this organization demonstrating service leadership by walking the talk? What would it look like? What would it sound like? What would it show up like in a real situation? Either external customer facing or internal service between colleagues, between different departments. Ready? Again, talk to the person across the table. What would be an example of rule number two of service leadership coming alive inside this bank? Go. Rule number three in service leadership is promoting, promote a common service language. Now, in an organization like yours, each function, each division, each department has its own technical language. There's a language of real estate, there's a language of lending, there's a language of insurance, there's a language of mortgage, there's a language of credit card, there's a language of... We're talking here about promoting a common service language. And as you can see before the break, it's produced by the service education. So for example, there are six levels of service. The lowest one is Criminal. Then? Basic. Followed by? Expected. Desire. And unbelievable, right? I mean, just in a very short period of time, you have learned a certain common language. But it, as quickly as it made sense, it could also fade away, right? Unless it was consistently promoted. And that's one of the rules of service leadership. So what would be an example? Where could you as a leader use that language, promote that language, ask other people to use that language? Use that language in a way that makes other things clear, that helps people to coordinate better with each other, to understand each other better, to choose new action to take with each other. Work with your colleague across the table. As a service leader, where could you actually promote the use of a common service language. Ready? You and your partner. Go. The fourth rule is called measure what really matters. There are many things that you can measure. You can measure churn, you can measure sales, you can measure profitability, you can measure external service performance, you can measure how long something takes, you can measure accuracy, you could measure margin. I mean, you can measure a lot of different things. But if you're looking to build an uplifting service culture, you have to be very careful about what it is that you tell your staff you're paying attention to as a leader. What is it that you say really matters? So if you say what really matters is top line revenue and bottom line profit, what message does that send to the staff? What's most important? The money, okay, not the service. So that is important. It's one of the ultimate business objectives, along with shareholder value and reputation. But it's a lagging indicator. It comes after everything else that you've done. A leading indicator of those ultimate objectives would be your survey scores, your satisfaction score, your loyalty index, your employee engagement score, right? If those are going up, you're going to get the ultimate objectives. But even that is somewhat lagging because you don't go survey everybody every day. There is another indicator. There is something that could let you know that you're moving in the right direction and that's positive customer feedback. If you're getting a lot of compliments, if you're getting a lot of input, if people are saying, ooh, I like it and thank you for doing that, if that's coming in in abundance, not only from external customers, but even between colleagues, then you know your survey scores are gonna go up, which is gonna lead you to the ultimate objective.
So now you can see you've got comments, which precede survey scores, which precede ultimate objectives. Here's the big question. What is it that has to happen before you even get a compliment? What is the necessary precursor, the required first step that results in a compliment that leads to a score that leads to the profitability? It's got to be some action that was taken that created some value that was above and beyond what the other person expected. So someone needs to look at a situation and someone who needs something, come up with a new idea, take a new action step, produce the value, get the compliment, get the scores, get the profitability and ultimate business objectives. You see how that works? Now, if I go to the thousands of people who work in this organization and I ask them in today's world, what does senior leadership pay most attention to? What would they say? The numbers. That's the culture that exists today. But you're looking to deliberately shift that culture now to be focused on service differentiation, uplifting services, the culture. So then what is it that we need to let the staff know really matters? What is it we should be measuring as a service leader? Is it just the numbers? Or should we be watching the scores and counting the feedback and actually keeping track of how many new ideas and new actions have we taken to create more value for someone else? As an uplifting service leader in this organization, you need to let your staff know that you're measuring what really matters. I want you to have a conversation at your table right now. How do you see that apply in this organization? How do you see you could apply that in a way that the staff that work with you say, hey, you know what the boss really cares about? You know what really matters? It's what are we doing today? What action do you take that creates more value for someone else? Conversation at your table. The fifth rule of service leadership, that one of those critical behaviors that a service leader needs to do in an organization is called enable and empower your team. Now, let me ask, in this part of the world, is that word empower? empowerment. Is it something familiar to you? Of course it is. Anybody who reaches a leadership position has heard this word, empower your team. You know, empowerment is important. What's the challenge around the word empowerment? Why is it that some leaders hesitate to empower, to give authority, to give responsibility, to give people the freedom, to make a decision, to take some action. What is it that would cause you to hesitate? Yeah, fear. Fear. If you're afraid that the person that you empower might do the wrong thing, make a mistake, make a bad decision. You know, if you can't be sure that that person is going to make a good decision, you would naturally hesitate to give them empowerment. Clear. But let's look at this the other way. If you could be absolutely sure that somebody could make a good decision, they understood, they could think well, they would come up with a, a good thing to do. If you could be sure, would you gladly empower them? Yes or no? Absolutely. So how do you know that someone can make a good decision? What is it that you would need to do in order to give yourself the confidence as a leader that in fact they could make a good decision in whatever situation arises. Yeah, very good. You would have to take responsibility for doing what? For, for what? For educating them, for coaching them and mentoring them and supporting them and helping them work through issues and even if they make a mistake, you wouldn't, you would say, great, let's learn from that together so that the next time you can make a better 
decision. That's why this rule is not empower your team. It's as a service leader, take responsibility to enable and empower your team. Now, let, let me be clear. When I talk about the sixth rule of service leadership out of seven, and it says remove the roadblocks to service, I'm not saying to remove yourself. I'm saying that over time, especially in an organization like yours that's grown so fast and promoted so many products and produced so many sales and so much profitability in such a short period of time that there can be certain boom, structures that end up in place that actually don't make it easy to go outside the structure. You end up putting process in place that looks like tomorrow should be like yesterday, which is like today, da, 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 da. and now you're asking them to be flexible. And now you're asking them to be more personalized in the way you respond to someone. And now we're asking them to come up with some new action that will produce a compliment, but they could look at all of the structures and the process and the procedures and say, hey, wait a minute, I can't do that unless you as the leader say, yes, you can. But boss, what about? And you say, no, 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 let me explain. That can actually be removed in a certain situation. Now, not randomly, but we're saying it's your job to listen for the frustrations of your staff. It's your job to anticipate what could get in their way. It's your job to listen for, for example, a customer complaint about the way something was handled. And instead of looking at who was the staff member and what did they do, you look at, well, what was the situation in which the staff member chose that? And what did they see was getting in their way of doing something else? That's the roadblock to service. What would be some examples of that in this organization? When you think about who you are and what your department does and how quickly you've grown, there's a lot of practice there. There's a lot of procedure there. There's a lot of process that's already in place. Could any of that look like a roadblock to doing something differently than your staff have normally done? Could you, as a service leader, take the lead in helping to remove the roadblock to service so that while we're educating and encouraging people to take new action, they won't say, but I can't. Why not? Because of, well, that would be the roadblock to service. And it's your job as a leader to help make that go away. What would be an example of some of the roadblocks your staff face today? Rule number seven in the seven rules of service leadership is sustain the focus and enthusiasm for uplifting service. Let's face it, there are a lot of things in daily working life that can distract people from service. There are a lot of things that can kind of push people back and slow people down. It's like sand in the gears. Your job is not only to remove the roadblocks, not only to promote the common language, but sustain that focus and enthusiasm over time. So what are some ways that you can do that? Well, when you educate people, that promotes. When you recognize people, pat on the back, that promotes. When you are a great role model, that promotes. When you take the lead and you acknowledge other people when they take the lead, that promotes and sustains the enthusiasm for service. Every organization, every part of the world, every industry has certain rituals and practices and protocol for the way we do things, right? Think about you and what it's like to work for you. What is it like to come to work on a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, when in this part of the world? And is there a morning kickoff? Is there an end of the day huddle? Is there a midweek acknowledgement? Is there an end of the week celebration? Or is it just go to work, do your job? How are the numbers? Do more. I mean, be honest. What could you do or could you do better that would help sustain the focus and enthusiasm on what we're asking people to do, which is take new action to create more value for someone else than someone has to be paying attention to taking action to create value for them. 
and that person's job is you. Right, so I'm sure that uh, uh, that gave a lot of insights to you and I have actually shared you the link uh, of the video as well. So uh, I would like you to listen to it again because it's a very, very interesting uh, training program which he has conducted uh, at First Gulf Bank and, uh, and it, it has a lot of sense as to how you can take the service leadership and the steps that you have to follow. Very, uh, very important uh, lecture. So I would like you to go through it again uh, and then basically come up with a summary next week so that uh, you, can, you can talk to me as to how you understood and how you can apply such a thing in your organization and we can basically have a chat on that. So I have shared the link to you also. right? So I have shared the link to you also for you to go and uh, listen to it uh, leisurely again and again and then uh, to come up with a summary for the class next week, right? So we have some people uh, here who are participating today. So you can basically come up with a summary and share your views. Uh, it will help you in both ways. One is that uh, it will you don't have to study it again for your exam. Number two, uh, basically uh, you will uh, be able to uh, become, uh, you don't have to study again, you will understand it much better. Fine, so uh, we have to move a little fast. So we are moving to service quality. Now service quality, uh, when it, there will be questions on this area, service quality and service recovery. Now, uh, I, what I have seen is some people who are not participating into the classes. When you say service quality, they write crap, right? They're basically what they think as quality, right? Uh, now, we are not here to write what we already know. Right? So we are doing a postgraduate diploma to learn something different, right? some kind of a scientific approach as to how you can do things. Right? So uh, when it comes to service quality, we are not talking uh, in a very general sense as to how we will increase and what we already know as common sense. That is not what we are talking here. We are going to have a, a very scientific approach as to how we can improve service quality which is a critical requirement when it comes to CRM because CRM actually revolves around uh, the quality of service because if the quality of service is poor then uh, you cannot actually work in acquiring, retaining and increasing share of wallet of the customers uh, of your organization. Right. So let's move forward. Uh, if you really look at service quality there are several definitions of service quality, but uh, we are going to look at it in uh, five dimensions. So when you say service quality, uh, we have identified five dimensions such as reliability, that is the ability to perform the, the promised service accurately. Then the second one, assurance, knowledge of employees and ability to convey trust and confidence. Number three is tangibles, that is the physical facilities, equipment, personal and communication material. And then empathy, provision of caring and individualized attention to customers. Uh, the final factor is responsiveness, that is the willingness to help customers and to provide prompt service. So when you are talking about service quality, we say service quality is a variable that are dependent on these five variables. And when you work with these five variables, the service quality will improve. Service quality will improve. So for you to improve service quality, you have to work on these five uh, dimensions so that in, in result would be an improvement in your overall service quality. So that is uh, what we are talking. So now, uh, Let's see uh, the importance of this. Uh, so I have looked at some research done on this area. So uh, if, you lay, if you take Akta, he says the organizational performance, success and survival are greatly determined by the 
service quality in the banking sector. Now, this is what he has found with his research on banking sector, which is really, really, really true. And right? if you really look at the banking sector, uh, what sometimes really drives the customer relationships is not the product because of obviously the, there is no major difference between the products, right? Uh, and uh, then uh, not the pricing. So there are no major critical differences, but the real differentiator uh, is the service quality. So if the service quality is high, uh, you can have real competitive advantage rather than you trying to uh, fight with product price place uh, promotions, right? Then uh, if you look at again another research, it says service quality is interpreted as perceived quality in the service literature and it provides the meaning of a customer's judgment about a service. Now again, what I'm trying to say is the service quality is not a very logical factor uh, where you can find uh, and which is common to everyone, right? It is, it is not like that. Now, when you make a particular, now if you say, if you make a particular product, it's there, but uh, uh, it can be weaved by everyone in the same way, but service quality is highly subjective, right? So it depends from person to person. And sometimes uh, certain people will look at service quality in a, in a particular angle, whereas another person will look at it at a different angle. And always remember, there's nothing called reality. It's all about perceived quality as to how the customer has perceived uh, the, uh, the, the quality uh, by using his experience and judgment. Then uh, if you look at Huffman and uh, Betterson, define service quality as an attitude formed by a long-term overall evaluation of firm's performance. So in this research, what they say is, the quality is not something that is generated with a one encounter, but it is an attitude, right? It is, an, it is a combination of uh, thinking, feeling uh, and uh, action towards a particular brand, which has developed over a long period of time based on the overall firm's performance. Then when you go to Lovelock, he says defi he defines service quality as consistently meeting or exceeding customer expectations. Now here he goes back to the general term. When you ask the question, what is quality? It's for most of us, quality is meeting the expectations. So if you, it's if you 12 have o'clock, a particular expectation and the product meets it, we say it's, it's a quality product, right? So when the product consistently or the service constant consistently, right? Meets or exceed custom expectation, he says that is interpreted as service quality. And so that is love law. And if you say go to uh, Gonrus, Gonrus, uh, yeah, he defines it as perceived quality of a service is the result of an evaluation process in which customers compare their expectations of service deliver delivery and its outcome to what they expect. And now here he tells again, right? Okay, it's a comparison of the expectations versus delivery, right? So he also uh, goes uh, in, in accordance with, I uh, mean, basically in line with love law, right? So again, what he says is, okay, it's a it's an evaluation process where the customer compare the ex expectation uh, and uh, uh, what what he has got, right? What he has really. Right. I was told that I missed uh, the whole thing. Uh, I, I think I was briefing this uh, slide. Uh, were you there when I uh, went up to assurance? Assurance again? You were in the previous slide, uh, Mr. Hitiarachi. That is the yeah. five dimension. That is the, the previous slide. Yeah. That's That's the, the, yeah, yeah. From yeah. 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 We were talking about the definitions of uh, service quality by. Yeah. Uh, may, may Harry. 
Anno. Oh, oh. yeah. When I was talking about Parasuraman's five dimensions. Uh, no, before that. No, no. Before. this one was not there. Uh, no, I think around the love lock. Love lock, yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, I have done two slides without you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right. So the last week as well, right, sir? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if I go the connection, my tagga the call at then, because but yeah. uh, yeah. otherwise I keep on going because I am on a different uh, screen, so I don't see you when I go to the PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so that's the thing. Anyway, if if you miss the connection next time, I just give me a call. Actually, I have done the lesson. <laughs> Basically, two slides I have been going without you. Fine. Okay, uh, let me let me start again, right? Uh, fine. So we were we were at love lock, right? Uh, so love lock uh, defines service quality as consistently meeting or exceeding customer expectations, right? So uh, when it comes to that, it is very very basic theory. Uh, where when when we look at some some product or service, we say it is quality if it delivers what we want. So that is a simple criteria of defining quality. So if we have taken a T-shirt, expecting to wear it uh, for six months, and if we, if, if even after six months, if it is looking better, then we say this is a very quality T-shirt, and it is now serving me more than six months. Because now, how do you say that? Then someone might say, no, no, quality shirt, T-shirt is something that should work for you for two years. So it is subjective, right? So, but it depends on what your expectations. If you have expected it to last for six months, and if it if it has lasted for six months, that is good quality for you. Right? But for some person, it may not be good quality unless it lasts for two years. Right? So uh, quality is subjective, and it is actually how you meet the expectations of the customer, right? And uh, and. Uh, and it's very, very, very difficult to answer. Uh, for example, there was this guy who was talking about uh, buying a branded, uh, branded uh, short. And this was when we were discussing about having a walk. And he was saying, so we need to buy this branded one. And uh, the same fake one was available in a different place. And uh, uh, my, one of my friends bought the fake one. The other one brought the uh, actual, the branded one. And uh, and we were I mean, basically having a chat, and he was saying that your one is fake, my one is branded. So he said, perfectly okay. Your one is twice the price that I have paid. So I don't mind uh, changing this within six months. Uh, you may talk about lasting for one year, but I don't want it. I don't mind changing it because I will change uh, uh, this within six months and buy another one, uh, use it for another six months. Then it's equal to you anyway. <laughs> so they were discussing about that. So it shows uh, what is quality is subjective, right? He, what he searches as quality uh, is subjective. That one has searched uh, he, for him. The quality is one year. For the person, it's it's uh, he's okay with the product that provides him quality for uh, six months, right? Uh, so likewise, it's very subjective, right? And uh, the. Then, uh, the, then even the other research, uh, Ron Bruce, it says that okay, the quality, uh, the the perceived quality of a service is the result of an evaluation process. So customer will evaluate. How is he doing it? Compare the expectations to service delivery and its outcome to what they expect. So it's a match between what is expected and what is delivered. Then we come to the uh, research that we are going to talk in the next uh, next class. And so the research done by Parasuraman in 1985, the, go the global evaluation, uh, so he defined the service quality as the global evaluation of attitude of overall excellence of service, right? So basically Parasuraman in 1985, uh, de developed, a uh, developed a scale called serve call and uh, in his initial research, he identified 10 dimensions under serve call and then afterwards, uh, further refining his findings, he narrowed it down to five dimensions. So what we are now going to go in depth 
uh, continue our discussion is on these five dimensions identified by Parasuraman and his research colleagues uh, during their research uh, research findings and presented in 1988 as the five service quality dimensions. So what are the five service quality dimensions? In a nutshell, we're talking about reliability, responsiveness, tangibles, assurance and empathy. So in a very simple sense, uh, reliability is the ability to perform the promised service dependably and accurately, right? So when someone gives you a call and asks for uh, product information, support, advice, you give him a, a accurate information, accurate advice, and they can depend on your uh, information, right? And if you provide a balance, that balance is right. If you tell them a particular uh, feature, the feature is there, it's, it's correct and they can depend on what you see. The second one is responsiveness, willingness to help, right? So this, this, this is actually uh, when the customer comes to you for support, how willing you are to help. And do you have people who are smiling and welcoming customers and they are to support when they come by greeting them, right? Do you have people when a customer comes to the branch, goes to him and say, Good morning, sir, madam, how can I help you, right? And do you have a call center when the customer calls that it connected fast and the person is really willing to help? Right? Or do you have a call center when you connect, it goes to uh, the answer machines and which takes about two, three minutes for them to reach the call center, right? So responsiveness, when the customer wants you, whether you are there, are you responding, right? Then the third factor is tangibles. The, the actually we, we said the customer associate quality with what is presented, right? So the physical facilities, equipments, machines, appearance, cleanliness, all comes under this, right? So tangibles actually convey the quality to the uh, customer. The fourth factor is assurance. How, uh, how assured he is about the service that you give. So is the person giving service has adequate level of knowledge and courtesy to support the customer, to convey trust and confidence. So when, when the customer deals with you, he feel very confident, right? He feel that your suggestions are really worth, right? And basically he has, he builds a good, strong relationship with you and depends on you. And basically he, he is willing to trust you, right? So can you bring that element to your service, the assurance? Then the final factor, is empathy, how caring you are about customer, how caring you are, right? So you must, uh, how, how well you under, understand the client, how well you uh, uh, understand his requirement, and then how well you fit that uh, requirement with your market offerings or the products or services, so that the customer will get the best uh, benefit or the best deal, best deal. So basically you serve by understanding the client. This is not sympathy. Sympathy, you have a customer has a problem and you cry with the customer. No, we are not telling you to cry with the customer. You see how you can uh, support the customer to bring out, uh, wipe his tears, right? So uh, the empathy part. So when you look at developing quality in your service delivery, you can work on these five dimensions, the reliability, responsiveness, tangibles, assurance, empathy. And when you work on these five dimensions, it will eventually create a service uh, product which is actually valued by the customer or desired by the customer and where the customer says the service is quality. Now when you say ask the question, why are you saying it's quality? They will come up with these answers. Ah, we can trust them. We can reach them fast. It's very convenient. Uh, they, they care for us. They, they are very dependable. Now, when you ask why you say quality, these are the ones, these are the uh, answers they give, right? So that means these are the dimensions which actually eventually comes in the abstract word quality, right? So you can't, you can't work with service quality. It's an outcome. You can only work with the uh, root causes or basically uh, the causes, uh, the, 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 the contributors, right? So those are these five dimensions. So there can be several other models that we can talk about, 
but in our course we are going to stick to this uh, five dimensions identified by the research done by parasuraman and his colleagues right so i'm not going to go any further on this because if we start the other areas then it takes goes a long way but we are going to learn about each dimension in depth and then uh, have an overall understanding on the service quality and service recovery in the next session so uh, now what we have done marketing information there will be certainly questions and uh, this part there will be at least two questions from this segment right so uh, we will meet next time to talk about it we are not going to start uh, further discussion on this so uh, let's let's catch up uh, next week any questions any questions are pronounced so we have only another uh, three classes no after this three classes right fine any questions right okay so we'll call it a day thank you have a nice day bye so, uh, excuse me sir yeah dishan uh, sir at the past papers do we have any questions like we can try at home uh, ah, yes, like sir. Uh, have, have they shared you past papers or they have not uh not yet sir any model questions like on ah, okay. the areas we have already covered fine fine i'll tell carling and share it right okay so sir. you look at the last uh, two years uh, they will share the two years right so you look at okay. those papers uh basically then you can have an understanding what kind of questions that might come in and uh, if you if you really participated for the classes i don't think it to be difficult but there will be theory and also the questions we look at how you will apply the theory practically also so there are part of questions which talks about theory uh, you can basically uh, uh, talk about theory uh, but at the same time they might look at the practicality also for example now i talk to you, i i spoke to you about uh, data science right so there can be a question where it says uh, write short notes on data science now that is critical theoretical question so you can write on data science and then score then they might also ask you a practical question uh, discuss how you can use data science to improve profits or improve service quality or in crm now you can't just write you have to see how you will apply it to the uh, to the practical side or combine the knowledge uh, and at the same time they might ask you as a branch manager how can you use data science to improve performance of your branch now that is a practical question you can talk the theory you have to tell what is data science and uh, what are the uses of it and then you can apply and say okay as the branch manager this is how i am going to use data science improve relationships and improve profits so that is a practical application so these are the different types of questions that might come in in your exam right so i took one area and i showed you how the questions can be modeled post to you uh, uh, with that so I, i think if you have stayed with the classes most of the things are have gone in that way right so we talked about theory and we talked about practical applications so uh, what i will do is i'll tell carling also to share you the papers but you also give him a call and try to remind him uh, so that you can basically have a look and if you have any questions next three classes you can clarify it with me okay okay sir thank you Fine. okay thank you